Welcome to Free Thinking 101, a course unlike any you have taken. We challenge you to examine your beliefs, values, judgments, your mindset, your biases and prejudices, your religion, your philosophy. In short, to examine the recesses of your mind and defend the cobwebs you store in that belfry. Free Thinking 101 is brought to you by the Rationalist Society of St. Louis, P.O. Box 2931, St. Louis, Missouri, 63130. Our guest speaker is Bernard Katz, a man who, who says he's proud to be a militant atheist. He also says he's been an atheist all his life, and like, that like all babies, he came out of the womb as an atheist. But unlike too many people, He's never regressed to the security blanket of religion uh, that mankind has needed since its infancy. In a word, he was born an atheist and grew up an atheist and will die an atheist. All he wants on his tombstone is Bernard Katz. He died, but he tried. Now retired, he spent half his life as a secondary school teacher, the other half as a stock and commodity broker. He's been a contributing editor of the American Rationalists since 1982. That's this magazine. Writing on a wide variety of subjects, from the Bible to the philosophy of science, to quite humorous pieces against religion, to current happenings. In fact, we've just put out a pamphlet of his responding to the Islamic threat against the life of the author of a book called The Satanic Verses. Bernard has titled it The Shriek of Araby. And if you'd like a copy, don't hesitate to send us a self-addressed envelope at the address that I mentioned earlier. It's short and sweet, and you'll love it. So it's my privilege to welcome one of our most prolific contributors who has been visiting us from South Jersey. Thank Glad you. to have you with us. I understand you're generally the topic you're going to present to us is something re regarding a war between science and religion. Yes, I am. In, in spite of the fact that there are some scientists who are religious and that we hear very little about the essential differences between science and religion. Why do you still maintain there's a war going on? There's a war going on because we are living in essentially a mode which is getting more and more anti-scientific. Mm -hmm. We have the New Agers, we have the astrologers proliferating like puppy dogs. We have pyramid power. We have uh, all kinds of importations uh, from uh, the Far East, like transcendental meditation, bearded gurus, ball headed Hare Krishnas, and so on. Don't forget the creationists. Well, the creationists are not necessarily from the Middle East, they're from <laughs> the Middle West. Yes. <laughs> That's true. So we seem to have gone through some kind of a cycle here in history where we went from, say, the Age of Enlightenment, which uh, finally ends the Middle Ages with its uh, scholasticism and so on, through the Age of Discovery and the Age of uh, aggressive analysis of the material world leading to, uh, right now, quantum physics, new cosmologies, and all the marvelous technological, we'll call them in quotes, miracles uh, that Americans certainly enjoy. And in the midst of all of this, what I think is great progress, uh, we have a regression. The New Age group uh, of thinkers or mythologists is merely a flashback to the ancient pagans, you see. So we have to find out what is going on here? There is definitely a conflict. And just because there are some scientists who can walk around as compartmentalized or schizodes, uh, where they 
uh, work five days a week in scientific laboratory using uh, rational or reasonable methods, and then on, uh, say, Sunday, uh, resort to uh, the mythological infancy of mankind, uh, doesn't cut any ice here. It sounds like they're dumping their own scientific method on Sunday. Yes. And uh, I know we're always hearing about the scientific method as the uh, only way of finding the truth, but there are others that say, no, there are many ways of finding the truth, and religion is, a, is one of them. Uh, what sort of comment would you have on that? I say, baloney, bunk. <laughs> to you're, put it bluntly. You're certain of that. Yeah, <laughs> certain of that. <laughs> First of all, we can duplicate just anything that a religious believer thinks is a unique revelation from God. We can do it through all kinds of means. Uh, for example, uh, we can uh, certainly give him psychedelics of various kinds, drugs, mm -hmm. certain mushrooms, alcohol. Uh, he can achieve these uh, so-called uh, mystic unifications of God through just dancing like uh, the dervishes uh, on the deserts. Uh, we can uh, let him engage in uh, isolation uh, techniques, uh, such as you find uh, when you uh, go to uh, flotation tanks, you see, uh, where all of your senses are essentially blotted out. Mm -hmm. uh, brainwashing uh, by uh, the Chinese and so on is essentially this kind of thing. Yes. Uh, starvation techniques, excessive sexual engagement will all lead to these uh, Delusions, you might say. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Illusions, certainly. Yeah. So we have this, this, this schizoid uh, kind of makeup in modern America. And uh, they are essentially at war with one another. Yeah. Um, are, are you saying that basically uh, these religious ways of knowledge are really not uh, deriving knowledge for the individual, they're deriving something else? That's right. It's a cry in the wilderness for many uh, other objectives. People have emotional needs, even militant atheists like myself. <laughs> yeah, I suspect so. Uh, yeah. So <laughs> instead of uh, engaging in rational, acceptable solutions, uh, they go into what I call throwbacks. Uh, they will engage in uh, such things as uh, allegorizing uh, certain kinds of reading matter, uh, putting on a spiritual plane. For instance, the theosophists uh, love, and the Christian scientists love to take uh, what should be literally interpreted in the uh, Christian Bible, and they will spiritualize it, put it on a high level so that you really don't know what they're talking about. It's a, a romantic uh, aspect. I, thought, I suppose you could consider mankind is constantly evolved in one of the cycles that oscillate between reason and emotion. And uh, it's amazing that the undeveloped countries of the world and most of the other world loves, really fervently, wants to engage in science and technology. Mm -hmm. and really dampen down the emotional outbursts that we call religion and so on. And the United States is going the other way. <laughs> it almost it's makes intriguing. you want to retreat to another Eden or paradise. Mm -hmm. One thing uh, I've often thought about relating to science and religion is that no matter where you go in the world, and I assume if there were people on Mars or other planets, uh, the method of science and the techniques of science would be the same. There's no such thing as American science and Chinese science that's different, or uh, Russian science or even Patagonian science, I suppose. But uh, wherever you go, science is the same. But wherever you go, religion is different. There's a Christian religion, Islamic religion, and they seem to be sort of geographically bound up. But science isn't that way. Would that have any bearing on this idea of knowledge? It sure does, and also has a bearing on science. In general, uh, Steve, you're absolutely correct. Science is the same wherever you go. Except when you run into the buzzsaw of uh, political ideologies. Uh-huh. For instance... Uh, Lysenko. 
Lysenko, exactly. Would you like to tell the audience a little bit about Lysenko? <laughs> well, Lysenko finally got his handles on the power of agricultural uh, agency in the Soviet Union. And he thought that uh, uh, the theory of Lamarck uh, was uh, the key to producing better and better uh, fruits and vegetables and so on. And he so persuaded the uh, leaders of the Soviet government uh, that they threw out all of the uh, members of the agricultural agency uh, that believed in what we call Western secular agricultural methods. Yeah, Mendelian genetics. Mendelian, that's right. Mm -hmm. Well, the result was a complete disaster for the Soviet Union. So finally they had to come to their senses and throw out this uh, Lysenko and uh, start all over again, but it was a you know, Essentially, thing. you're saying that when scientists don't behave like scientists, they tend to end up more like the religionists. Exactly right, mm -hmm. because communism, as a little aside here, is nothing more or less than another kind of mythology, you mm -hmm. see. It is the uh, a transformation of a religious uh, heaven uh, that we know in uh, Christianity, uh, to that of a political heaven, as uh, the messiahs and prophets of uh, uh, Marx and uh, Lenin uh, have proclaimed. Mm -hmm. And we can see the disastrous results today in the Soviet Union yeah. and the Iron Curtain countries. See, as soon as you start putting in the supernatural, and that's essentially what religious people do, the theologians and so on, or the uh, political uh, ideologues of uh, communist countries or the fascist countries go beyond the earth into the supernatural. They get in all kinds of trouble because there are no checks and balances on them. Our own founding fathers firmly believed in checks and balances. It makes the process of government longer, but at least you don't run into too many mistakes that way. There's somebody to correct you. So scientists have built in to their very methodology this self-correcting system. For example, before you can publish anything in a scientific journal, it must go through a hierarchy of committees, each one composed of better and better experts. That's why a guy like Velikovsky was not able to get published in scientific journals, and a man like Einstein, whose ideas are certainly much more imaginative, you might say off the wall, was published in scientific journals. Yeah. So essentially, uh, one of the essential differences between those who are religious and those who are secular or rationalist like ourselves is this very idea that they insist that there is something beyond the real world. In fact, they really invert it. It's a transformation of values, as Nietzsche would say. What we consider real, real is really illusionary. And it's the mysterious and the unseen, as St. Paul says, that's real. Mm -hmm. I've heard it said that, uh, and I've heard this said of, by, in the area of philosophy and also in the area of religion, that science has a certain area within which it's a, it is, is competent and has found many things that are you know, valid and reliable, but there's a whole area that they haven't uh, so far been able to get into and that's the legitimate area of the philosophers and the religionists. And I'm not sure if you would agree with that or not. No, as a matter of fact, one of the things that scientists do, even though they're not conducting uh, this, uh, this analysis in a uh, laboratory with test tubes and measuring rods and so on, they certainly have made a science of the field of mythology. Mm -hmm. And comparative religion is nothing but the study of various religions and uh, comparing them to one another. Mm -hmm. uh, they have even, in the field of music, which is one of the most emotional aspects of human experience, they've synthesized it. They have converted music into mathematics, and the mathematics into vibrations on magnetic tapes, and the machinery turns out music. In fact, you don't have to write music anymore. No. Yeah, see? So all... Synthesize it. Exactly right. Yeah. I, I would like to just backtrack one, one bit and say I didn't mean to link the philosophers and the religionists. I think the philosophers have a different orientation. They're concerned with truth 
and in a speculative way, whereas I think the religionists are not at all speculative. They think they have the truth, and uh, that's it. Well, once again, I think you got the handle on a partial truth. I think mm -hmm. you can find a great many philosophers, some of them highly prestigious, like Socrates and Plato, who really, <laughs> who really think uh, that they had the handle on the truth. You see? Yeah. They weren't speculating. They knew. Well, we have found out subsequently that they're dead wrong. Mm -hmm. For instance, it's an embarrassment to the ghost of Aristotle that almost everything he said scientifically has turned out to be exactly wrong. Mm -hmm. And the poor man really held back science for a whole 1,500 years because he was that wrong. Yeah, he antedated science, as many of those early philosophers yeah. did. Although they were dealing with some questions that are still very contemporaneous. Like? In the area of philosophy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like what is matter and uh, some of the idealistic ideas they had. So the mind, uh, yeah, the mind body, body, or mind brain yeah. uh, dualism and so on. That's true. Yeah. Now, I'd like to point this out before I let it slip my mind that one of the great checks and balances that I was talking about before right. in science which is not true in religion, is that it is really public knowledge. If a man says, hey, I have found something, like uh, uh, they uh, proclaimed not so long ago at the University of Utah, mm -hmm. he immediately laboratories and scientists all around the world try to duplicate this. And they will let you know, hey, can't find out what's been going on here because we can't duplicate in the laboratory. That's like cold fusion recently. Exactly, mm -hmm. yeah. So this doesn't happen in religion. Yeah. A man could come down from any mountain or out of any uh, cellar, make a proclamation, he may get some followers, but there's no check on him. How mm -hmm. can you? Yeah, I've, I've often wondered about that. If a scientist makes a statement, the burden of proof is on him. If a religious person makes a statement, the burden of proof is on the other person that says, well, I don't think that's true. And that seemed not quite right to me. Oh, you're absolutely right here. The burden of proof is never on the person who takes the negative side. This is the state of Missouri. If you say I'm from Missouri, the show me state, show me, the burden of proof is not on you. Uh, uh, it's on the person who's making the positive assertion. Mm -hmm. This is one of the rules of the game. I know a great many people say, hey, you cannot prove there is no God. Well, it's not incumbent upon me to do so. I'm not making a positive assertion that there is. Since you are, you must try to prove it. And obviously, he can't. There's been no proof, every kind of proof, whether a supposedly a material revelation or a philosophical one, has all been creamed, all been decimated. Now, while I'm at it, before I forget this, I'd like to point out similarities and dissimilarities between religious thinking and scientific thinking. After all, both of them are done by human beings and some of them are done by the same human being. The whole process, believe it or not, is rational until one point. You start off with certain hypotheses and then you develop that in a rational way that makes sense. There are connections, logical, you can put them in a computer and so on. And say, aha! Here is my eureka or my conclusion. And the conclusion of many believers is, yes, it's quite true that Jesus was incarnated, that he was born of a virgin, uh, that he went to heaven, that he came back briefly, and he will come again, and so on. But scientists will say, let's see if we can verify it through some experiment. And if the experiment doesn't work out, it's called defalsification. But the religionists refuse to go that final unique but extremely important step. So the thinking of both groups really is rational up to a point. Mm -hmm. It's that last step which either takes you over the cliff or keeps you safe that's important. <laughs> I've heard that said in somewhat different way and that is somewhat along the line that a person should be willing to test out their beliefs mm -hmm. and not just accept a belief on the basis of someone's authority or that some book said it, or something of that sort. But they should actually take their belief and test it out and see if it holds any water. And if it doesn't, then reject it and find something better. 
That's what you do. And uh, I think we should try this not only in the areas of science, but also in the areas of everyday living, uh, in politics, in issues that come up. Uh, an issue such as abortion, for example, I think that could be analyzed in uh, some way so you can get more at the truth than, uh, than we have so far. But I think people should test their beliefs some way or another. And uh, probably in a common sense way, we do test a lot of our beliefs. For example, uh, not too many of us walk out in the street when a car is coming along. Uh, we haven't had to be run over to find out about that, but uh, we have tested the belief some way or another that that could cause us uh, grievous harm. And I think a lot of common sense is that kind of thing on that level, and a lot of this is done. But when you get into these more abstract ideas and things of that sort, many people take them on the basis of what someone has told them to believe. All right, that brings into the problem of authorities. Whose authorities do you accept? Mm -hmm. Do you accept the authority of your pastor or your rabbi? Because after all, uh, they're supposed to be telling you the truth. I said supposed to. But are they? Because they're merely accepting someone else's authority. Until you all go back to the origin, like in the New Testament, where Jesus says, I'm telling you the truth. And the Jews who confront him said, how can we tell you're telling the truth? He says, well, I have two witnesses. Who are these witnesses? God, my Father, and I am the witnesses. Well, that would be thrown out of court, you see. Mm -hmm. Those are ersatz type witnesses. But in science, uh, the authorities have to actually produce results. We don't really care whether the man has uh, uh, had a prestigious uh, uh, role in science or not. If his uh, latest proclamations uh, are not verified, we're not going to go along with it. Yeah, that, that raises the question of the, just the layman accepting something that's scientific. Uh, I mean, the average layman knows very little about nuclear physics. That's true. So why should he take the word of a, a scientist that claims certain things? Well, I admit this is very difficult because we've had some very great scientists who have gone off the end on this thing. Mm -hmm. For instance, uh, uh, Sir James Jeans, uh, a great uh, astronomer, uh, came up with the concept of God as the great mathematician. And uh, we have uh, a very great recent scientist, Stephen Hawking, who uh, infuses uh, his science with God talk. And we have Einstein, who thought that God did not roll dice, meaning that he just could not accept the uncertainty principle that comes out of what is known as quantum physics. Mm -hmm. see? And uh, therefore, uh, Einstein is placed in the pantheist camp. But these men should not make such statements because the layman takes them at their word. That there is some kind of a spirit floating around out there or part of uh, all substance that we are aware of. These men should be very careful when they make these statements. But once again, how do you find out yeah. which authorities to accept? Well, one, one way that I do it is I check other authorities in the field. See if they agree. See if they agree. If they do not, well, then I get one eyebrow raised against the other. You mm -hmm. see, I get very skeptical. There's another way of looking at that, too. Uh, if there is a scientific authority, in theory, you could go to school, you could learn nuclear physics and quantum mechanics and all that sort of thing, and you could check it yourself directly. In theory, you can do that. But I don't think the same thing can be said for much of the, what passes for religious knowledge. There's nothing you can, well, there are uh, religious scholars, certainly. And religious scholars uh, do look at whatever historical record they can locate and come up with, I think, very interesting conclusions, some of which many of our listeners may not agree with. But uh, there are limits to that. And, uh, uh, so we can't really 
uh, verify things as, as well that way as we can with scientific knowledge. No, but we can certainly unearth enough prestigious authorities who themselves are religious, so the claim can't be made, hey, this is really highly prejudicial because they're atheists or agnostics. You can find among top Christian scholars enough material to blow away the whole New Testament. Mm -hmm. In fact, there is a committee that's been ongoing uh, for, I don't know, two, three, four years, which is trying to sift out the actual words that Jesus said in the New Testament, and they are eliminating this and this and this. By the time they get done, there won't be enough uh, to make a small lollipop out of, you see. Mm -hmm. Now, these are prestigious scholars. I mean, uh, there is no heaven and the buts about it, but you can use that material to throw this into the face of these uh, truculent Christian believers, particularly uh, the religious right. I think we can get into one last question, and that is, what are some of the practical consequences of this incompatibility between the world of religion and that of science. Well, if you are living in the present day and you watch your television, read your newspaper, the abortion issue, which is uh, one of the great issues right now, is uh, trying to be settled by people who are not scientific in their thinking. They are archaic religious believers. And they're dealing with such uh, nonsense as uh, soul. And when the soul is infused, and when the fetus becomes quickened, is it uh, a human being and so on. We're getting to all of these very ancient concepts which uh, not only the Catholic Church and certain fundamentalist Protestant groups, uh, but uh, uh, ultra-religious Jews uh, want us to continue to uh, believe in, and we simply cannot. Mm -hmm. okay? You take prayer in a school. No one has ever proved the efficacy of prayer. And yet, there is a great insistence that legislation be passed to compel, or at least, allow the existence of time for children who want to, to pray. And of course, we have faith healers uh, who, uh, under the guise of church-state separation, uh, do their damage to their uh, uh, people who attend. Their followers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we have the infusion of all other kinds of uh, religious concepts uh, honeycombing the government. There's the attempt of the creationist group to influence what is taught in school Absolutely. in the area of science. And uh, I think that's one of the dangerous yeah, we things. We thought we were all, all over that uh, when the monkey trial was over in the 1920s. And now we've got to spend all this money and all this energy going through the courts again. Yeah. Well, I want very much to thank you for being with us. I want to say a few things just to wind things up. First of all, if you would like uh, a copy of the American Rationalists. We would be very glad, very pleased to send you a copy. If you send us your name and address, uh, we can send you one of these. It will probably have something by Bernard Katz in it. Does. It does. He uh, very frequently is involved in or has contributed to this magazine and you will find it a very eye-opening and worthwhile article. Well, this has been Free Thinking 101 brought to you by the Rationalist Society of St. Louis. Our address is Box 2931, St. Louis, Missouri, 63130. We will be glad to send you a copy of the Rationalists and little information about our program. Watch for our next program in this series and write us your comments and suggestions for topics to discuss. Thank you very much.